I'm the CTO and one of the co-founders of uh, Copenhagen Atomics. The company was founded back in 2015 by a group of uh, engineers and scientists around the idea of uh, building um, Brea molten salt reactors uh, in thermal spectrum based on thorium. The design that we proposed back in 2015 was to use a heavy water uh, moderator that improves uh, the neutronics. The heavy water doesn't degrade like graphite does over time, but we do need um, special materials to separate the salt and the heavy water in order to be able to breed, but we don't need to start with those materials straight away. The heavy water is then um, room temperature and unpressurized, and it's then being uh, constantly circulated at a high flow rate, cooled and being pumped actively back in so it would drain in case of a shutdown. That also uh, goes to the salt. We scrap the idea of a freeze block and just have the salt go through the dump tank, basically, that is then responsible for decay removal when it's under shutdown. And one of the other ideas we proposed back in 2015, uh, the idea of heavy water was proposed as far back as the aircraft reactor experiment and the program back then. Molten salt reactors, by their nature, lend themselves to be miniaturized and put inside of the size of a 40-foot shipping container. And the reason we want to do this is because our whole goal as a company is to mass produce molten salt reactors on an assembly line so we can have a reactor that can scale to meet global energy demand in the future. So the idea of the company is just that we build the reactor. We don't build any of the power conversion cycle or whatever the heat is used for. We let uh, the consumer decide that and we just sell the heat. One of the other things we proposed was to use uh, what we call vacuum spraying, which is basically spraying the entire salt volume just upon leaving the core to extract as much of the volatile fission product as possible and then recirculate the, the helium through uh, scrubbers and filters um, to separate out uh, the fission products. If we just extract the xenon and krypton just upon leaving the core, because the fission products decay through multiple elements towards the line of uh, stability, we can actually extract uh, quite a big margin up to like 15% of the fission products if we capture them uh, while they're being created. If we can then also extract some of the other volatile fission products, extract a much larger fraction of the fission products, which is all in, in the goal of retrieving a, a breeder in the long term. One of the other things we proposed uh, back in 2015 was to use uh, LIPS for online monitoring. One of our co-founders has worked with LIPS for two decades, so it was an obvious choice for us and one of the things we've been working on ever since. This was the design we proposed back in 2015, uh, but the approach we did towards getting to uh, building one of these reactors has been quite different than some of the other companies. Basically, we we looked at going through approval of a paper design. What, we, what seems to be the need or the, the risk of a, uh, building reactors is more the technology and the, all the components and systems that have to work together inside of a reactor. So we started building all the subcomponents that would go into that design and start building the supply chain to build our reactor. And that's the path we've been on ever since. The goal we also uh, set forth was before building commercial reactors to build one megawatt demonstration reactor or maybe even several one megawatt demonstration reactors with different materials and geometries. Uh, and we see this as an approach that where we can move faster in the beginning and test all the components with inexpensive stainless steels and inexpensive salts before we ever get to any nuclear part where we have to involve regulators and where any uh, chains or thing that we have to alter becomes very expensive. Earlier this year, we then got a fair amount of funding to build a non-fission prototype for the next coming two years. We started building and selling this loop all the way back in 2017. Here in 2019, we had basically all the components we need for a bare bones boiler plate non-fission prototype. And so this non-fission prototype is basically a one-to-one -one scale, one megawatt demonstration reactor that fits inside of a 40-foot shipping container. And it has all the same features, but scaled back. So for example, the vacuum spraying we talked about, we might not implement that yet. It's all the key components like pumps, core, the heavy water and the separation materials. They might just be stainless steel in the beginning, and it might be a heat exchanger and the dump tank, the bare bones minimum of what a one megawatt demonstration reactor. And only when we've built and tested that, will we then decide on what country to test it in. We're already talking to some facilities and countries about their facilities, but we're looking at multiple options. And the salt we're looking for using here is a lithium fluoride, thorium fluoride, and hopefully starting on plutonium. But if we can't get our hands on that, we'll go fine with just enriched uranium. And so you might think that this is trying to build something similar to what they did uh, in the MSRE, but it's actually more akin to what they did in the aircraft reactor experiment, which was they built a 2.5 megawatt thermal molten salt reactor. You see the core geometry on left, a small size, and they only operated for a couple of weeks. 
if we can only get approvals to operate it for a couple of weeks, that's what we'll do, but probably up to a couple of months uh, if we're allowed to. The key difference being, of course, that we want to use heavy water and then insulation material between salt tubes. We would like to use silicon carbide here or silicon carbide composites or some other variants of that. But if we can't get it approved in time, we'll just use stainless steel for the brief life of the reactor. This is also similar to the approach that they took in the MSRE days and before that in aircraft reactor experiment days, which was to build a bunch of loops and test the components before you ever get to building a reactor. Here you see one of the fuel pump loop test setups. And on the right, you see a flow straightener that dislodged and got caught into the impeller eye. And that's just to say that even after decades of experience, you still have components failing on you and, and stuff breaking. And that's uh, part of the course. And that's why we do testing. And even after the MSRE days, buildings filled with loops. This is sort of similar to what we're trying to do. We're making the loops a lot more compact. There was a lot of piping between the different components. Our approach, design the all these as our containerized reactors, basically have all the electronics and heating system, gas system management inside of tight containment. And you see here some of the loops we've built since 2015. First one was a pressurized fed loop. And now we're currently on our fifth generation of loops, which has more or less the same capabilities as some of those loops you saw at Oak Ridge. Just compressed down a lot more. We need a lot more of these loops and we're happy with the design. So we're scaling the production off of them. We're building some other systems that is a 500 liter solar salt loop. What allows us to do this is basically a pump, which is a canned rotor pump. So that's very different than the cantilever type pump they had in the MSRE days, which is basically you have a pump at the bottom, you have a long shaft and a dynamic seal, and then you have a, a motor at the top that you keep cold. Where this design is compressed uh, into a canned rotor pump, so that means that the rotor and impeller are together, actuated electromagnetically, and that allows us to just weld the whole thing up and not have any dynamic seals. We're currently looking at building a version of this with electromagnetic bearings, and that basically allows us to also levitate the impeller and rotor assembly on an electromagnetic field so we don't have any wearing surfaces. We actually expect to get something like 10 years lifetime inside a reactor without any service because there's no contact area besides the salt. We're basically testing and building all the small subsystems that we need to put inside of a one megawatt demonstration reactor, but first for our non-fission prototype. And here you see some of the different components we're testing, heat exchangers, our newer pump and filters, valves, tanks, gaskets, that sort of stuff, roughly where the components would fit inside of a reactor. We're located in Copenhagen along with Elf Lavel, one of the world's leading uh, manufacturers of heat exchangers. We're looking to use one of their plate heat exchangers up to 700 degrees C, so it's an all stainless steel braced plate heat exchanger we expect to be able to use in our reactor, get a lot more efficiency out of that compared to classic shell and tube heat exchanger. So the loop I mentioned here before, it's a fuel salt loop inside the furnace that is then encapsulated in another shell. And both of those containments then have argon in the atmosphere. And then we have an air conditioning to keep all the electronics actuating and BFDs cooled. Then you see here our older version of pump inside the loop can put in different components and pump salt around, run different tests with the different kinds of salts. We always start testing with water and then we move on to nitrate salts, which is also what they use in the solar power industry, but that has a limit of 560 degrees Celsius. And then we move on to Flinac, which is our main testing salt for fluorides. And you see here an ingot, we produce in one kilo batches where we have to purify them before we can put them in the loop to eliminate moisture and oxygen and other contaminants. Here you see one of our other loops pumping the salt. If we turn the light off, this is one of our pressure fed loops with Flinac at 700 C. You can see it's glowing red hot. This is showing nitrate salt. The viscosity and fluid characteristics is very similar to water. The nice things about the nitrate salts is they allow you to test things without needing inert atmosphere and it's a lot easier to handle. They have lower melting points. Then we usually go on to Flinac and test with that. Here I'm doing silicon carbide tubes at 900 degrees Celsius. We're getting tubes from different vendors and then stress testing them by dunking them into room temperature water, simulating a worst case accident in one of our cores. If water spilled in past its containment into the insulation layer and directly onto the silicon carbide. We use Alpha Lavelle a lot for assembling our loops. They have world-class machinists and welders. So also all these parts, forged, investment cast, stamped, molded, similar them here in Copenhagen and built these loops from them. We have something like two 200 plus suppliers. The roadmap for us, minimal viable product in terms of a test reactor before we ever move on to larger scale 100 megawatt. And only after that in the 2030s, commercializing these reactors and build them on an assembly line. This whole space here we're moving into and see some of our loops. We hope to have this whole room filled up with loops within the next year. 
if you're a molten salt tinker out there who is looking for a job, write to us. We also bought a laser welder recently that we're going to install there to manufacture some of these more challenging parts. We also got approval earlier this year to run some of these loops with fertile salts outside of Denmark. I can't say which country yet. We're basically preparing for that by starting with some stagnant salt tests. So we have three different test setups preparing to run with the fertile salt test, but we'll ship them out soon. This is basically all the electronics valve acquisition. We need to test flanges and basic corrosion before we start pumping salt that is fertile in one of our loops. This also caught the attention of the IEA. Two weeks ago, we got a safeguards visit from the IEA, inspectors that took uh, nice samples and made sure we weren't doing anything we're not supposed to, which of course we're not, but yeah, that was a very friendly visit. And lastly, I, I would say that as part of this uh, selection of where to build our first demonstration reactor, we're supporting this petition to build it in the Netherlands. So if you would support that, go sign that. Uh, the first one is, what's the maximum temperature on the canned pump? Basically 700C. It's uh, whatever the material you use, we use stainless steel. So if you go 700C with stainless steel for a prolonged time, you might have some issues. You could build it out of, out of other materials, but that's going to cost more and take longer time. So we don't need that right now. We just need something that works well enough. Okay. So that's why everything is stainless steel 316. Are the new MS systems from Copenhagen Atomics equipped with flow measurement devices? We're working on flow sensors. It's not a high priority for us. Well, we have some different ideas and we have some tests in the making. If you want to collaborate, that's one of the things we're working on. We also sell these loops commercially, starting at 88K. So that's a bargain. Why, if you can elaborate on why the Netherlands of all places, why is that the right place? There's always been a lot of support in the Netherlands for molten salt reactors. They have uh, facilities there that are approved to have certain kinds of nuclear tests not the only likely place. We're also looking to the US, of course, but also other places. So the Netherlands is somewhere like NRG at Petten or somewhere like that because of their work? Yeah, that's one of the promising places. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So there's no more questions. So thank you very much for your time. Appreciate the black and white image. I'm going to try and do that for my own cameras in the future. Thanks. Inspired me. <laughs> so thanks, Aslak.